Okay. All right. So where were we? <laughs> I'm welcoming you all to worship. We now have collection. We're using the collection plates this week for the first time. And if you look in the pew in front of you, yay! Um, in a long time. If you look in the pew in front of you, there are a lot of things back there that haven't been there in a long time. And we'll talk about those as I move along through my long sheet of announcements. So sit back and relax. Okay, but if you are a first-time guest, um, go down to the um, Welcome Center after the service to pick up a gift bag. Um, if you have a prayer request or a praise report, please write it get to write it on a white prayer card from the pew rack in front of you, those things are back, and place it in the offering plate. We ask that you print um, so that Pastor Victoria can um, read, the, um, read it more clearly, and she'll um, be using those during the pastoral prayer. Also in the pew rack in front of you are the salty service fish. And if you have served others in the name of the church this past week, Please place a fish in the collection plate, you know, the one that's getting passed again, yay, <laughs> um, when it comes by uh, later in the service. Um, tonight is our monthly prayer service. It will be held at 6 p.m., and I believe that Vicki would like to come up and talk a little bit about that. Okay. <laughs> everything was so back to normal this morning. I told Dave Basquin I didn't know where to look for everything, but we've had, <laughs> had it so different for so long. But I did ask Pastor Victoria if I could have just a few minutes this morning, so I'll do this quickly. I see some faces of people I don't know, so I want to tell you that <clears throat> I am the lay leader for this church, and there's a lot of things that are going on that you probably have questions or concerns about. And I may not have all the answers, but I'll find them for you. So please, um, I'm in the directory for the church. You can call me at any time. And um, I'll just do my best, try to be the person between so that we're all on the same page. <clears throat> and I want to tell you that as a lay leader, I attend four meetings a month. I really don't even mind it. I want you to know that you have people behind the scenes on these committees working for you that are, are giving it 101%. Whether it's the, I haven't even had to go to a nominating meeting, but the <clears throat> admin council, um, Jim is in charge of that, he's the uh, head of that, and I think the man can tell you what page everything is on, he knows the book of discipline quite well, and he didn't just learn that overnight, he, he's there, and he leads us and he keeps us on task. Tom Connor has accepted and been working on SPRC, and uh, that's a committee that really needs your prayers right now. We, we have some things we need here, and we are, we're praying. And with the trustees, gosh, they're after, every, they look at every corner of this church. They walk the grounds. Um, they're just doing their very best to keep us up and running. So they, and we have a devotion there each time, too. Uh, hmm, Byron. <laughs> he's in charge of our money. He's our money man. And he's pretty good about it, too. <laughs> he's like, don't spend anything you don't have to spend. I appreciate him because not only does he have that knowledge, he loves children so much he danced with them up here for vacation Bible school, and he probably wants me to stop saying that, but I just think it's wonderful. <laughs> and the other thing I wanted to talk about very quickly is uh, the pastry peddlers. I just have so much fun doing that, and I want you to know that we, don't, we do it once a month. We've had four Sundays, and we have over $1,300. And... <laughs> We may not have been able to tell you exactly what we're going to do with it, but it's not going anywhere until we do, and um, probably missions work, but not only do you get to take a goodie home to eat, but you're helping your church out, So we, and we appreciate the ladies, um, let's see, Julie, who, let's see, Julie and John Basquin and I are the pastry gals, but we've had others in the church that have said, like Connie, I'll bake for you and Marty, so we appreciate your help. And last but certainly not least, John, uh, you are? Joy. Joy! <laughs> I need to be in my seat. Joy did um, mention the prayer service. We meet once a month for one hour, and we really would like to invite all of you. And I was reading in, uh, I think it was in Matthew, where 
when Jesus overturned the tables and ran out the money changers, he said, my father's house is a house of prayer. He didn't say that it was of worship or sermons or fellowship, which we all like. It was a house of prayer. And if we've ever needed prayer, it is now. So don't be put off by thinking somebody's going to turn to you and say, will you pray now? Nobody's going to do that. Mostly we pray for our local church, for our worldwide Methodist church, and for our beloved country. And within an hour, we're out the door. So we'll meet out in the office, and we'll be there at 6 tonight, and you're all welcome to come. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vicki, for all those um, reminders and um, letting us know who to contact and who to see about various um, things that are happening in the life of our church. All right, back to the list of announcements. Next one, Wednesday dinner. Please join us every Wednesday at 5.30 p.m. for our Wednesday fellowship dinner. And you can sign up in the Narthex or you can call the office, but do that by noon on Monday so that the people that do the shopping can make sure that they can have enough food here for Wednesday night. The cost is a suggested donation of $5 per person or $20 per family. Um, the coffee bar out there. Stop by the coffee bar and stay grounded in faith. Get it? Grounded, you know, like coffee grounds. Grounded in faith between 9.45 and 11.15 on Sunday morning, so before worship and um, a little bit afterwards. And we'd like to say thank you to the volunteers who have been running the coffee bar. So far, we have monthly volunteers and substitutes through August, and we are looking for people to help out in September. So grab a friend and see if you can volunteer, and you can get trained and instructions are provided. Um, and plan to start coffee by 9.30. So if you can be here by 9.30 to start coffee, that would be great. So if you could, um, then you empty the pots and you unplug the machine as the crowd leaves the service. And if you are interested, please call the office for more details. They really would like some more substitutes and we appreciate the people, or more people volunteering. We appreciate the people that have been stepping up and doing that already. Um, August 7th, in a few weeks from now, is our next quarterly church work day. Uh, we ask you to save the date and plan to be there. Or if you can't be there and like to bless the crew with a lunch donation, you can do that. Um, and if you have some hidden talents to share, like erosion control, attention to detail, caulking, they could really use your help. And there'll be more details to come between now and then, but put that on your calendar, August 7th. Did you recently replace your iPad? Do you have one that you don't really use? We are seeking two iPads to help with our worship services. One will be used to run the program for our new live stream camera, yay! And one will be used um, to program background tracks that we are purchasing to help out our praise band. If you have one you are willing to donate, please let the office know, and we appreciate that very much. Okay, and there are more announcements. I'm gonna keep going. Next one. If you or anyone you know is interested in any of the following positions, please contact the office for a job description and an application. Some are part-time positions and they may be able to be combined to a full-time position. And so here is the list of positions that are available at this time. Youth and Children's Director, Traditional Worship Leader and Choir Director, Contemporary Worship Leader, Video Tech, and Nursery Worker. All right, so if you or someone you know you think would be interested in one of those or more than one of those, please contact the church office. And I have one more announcement. The Disaster Committee is putting together a list of volunteers who can help pre and post storm in the event that LaBelle is hit with another hurricane. If you would be willing to hang up shutters or to fill sandbags or make phone calls or clean up limbs or whatever needs to be done, there are many areas where you can help. We are looking for people who think that they may need help before or after a storm to sign up in advance as well. So there are forms for both things and, um, in the narthex and many more details on the flyer inside our bulletin, so you can check that out. Okay, are there any other announcements that I need to lift up or we need to lift it up at this time? Okay, let's all stand up and greet one another. Yay. Greetings. 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 <laughs>
All right, let's come back together again for our invocation. Let us bow in prayer. Sometimes, Lord, it seems that you are far away and we are overwhelmed with the need of others. Let us turn to you whose very heart is compassion and hope and let us be partners in caring for all who are in need. Amen. Seeing the collection plate again is going to be after we do the, the offering, okay? So, now we're supposed to sing.
Yeah. She just had to turn the page. <laughs> but you can, but you may stay standing or you may sit if you feel comfortable. I stay standing. stand for our affirmation of faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven 
and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. And I'd like to invite our ushers to come forward. I'd like to remind you as our ushers are preparing that you can still give online at um, www.carlsonunc.org or on the Carlson app if you are not able to worship with us. Thank you. I see you. <laughs> Got my mute on. Hold on. Nope, I'm unmuted. Yes, I am muted. There I am. I pushed it the wrong way. <clears throat> seem to be having a little technical difficulty. I also sat on my cord. So <laughs> it'll improve. All right, let's start over. Okay, as the ushers are now ready, I'd like to remind you that you can still give on the website, carlsonumc.org, also on the Carlson app, if you're not able to be here or you happen to be traveling, and you can also drop your tithes and offerings in our offering plate. So let's be in an attitude of prayer as we prepare to receive our tithes and offerings. Loving God, we thank you for this time we have to give to you as we worship you. And we ask that you help us with our time, our talents, our gifts, our service, and our witness, that all may be used for the work of your kingdom in your world. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand for the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise for the Son and Holy Ghost. be seated and I'd like to invite our children to come up.
Come on up, kiddos. <clears throat> Kids and stuffed animals are welcome. <laughs> How is everybody? Hey. How is everybody? Oh, okay, there we go. See, we're alive. How are you? Good. Oh, see, look, you can hear yourself. Good. Well, today, kind of in preparation of school, starting back up soon, we're going to talk a little bit about numbers. Who's excited? Woo. Oh, there's one for, yeah, yeah, numbers. All right. So, what's, what's bigger, 2 billion or 120? What is that? 2 billion. 2 billion. 2 billion. What's bigger, 10 or 1? 10. You guys know? Ten. Ten is one. So more is better, right? Would you guys rather have ten of something or one of something? What was that? Ten of something. Would you rather have ten of something or one of something? Uh, what about you? Would you rather have ten of something or one of something? What if that something was bee stings? Do you want ten bee stings or one bee sting? One. One but I thought 10 was better. 10 is more, right? But one is better. Oh, so one can be better. It just depends. Oh, okay. So see, it depends on how we look at things or how we view things. So one might be pretty good. While I'm talking, why don't, why don't we put the uh, Bibles to use here? Why don't, uh, if you've got a Bible in front of you in the pew there, why don't you turn to the book of Acts chapter one? Look, everybody's going to get a workout right here. So, 2 billion is a big number. We can agree with that, right? Is 120 a lot? Remember we talked about this? Emmy, is 2 billion a lot? Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. Is 120 a lot? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. How many Christians do you think there are in the world right now? Anybody? We'll throw this out to the audience. <laughs> Not enough. I like that. Hey, you come up here. It's your turn. <laughs> this is good. Three million. Three million. Anybody else? How many Christians in the world right now? Four million. Four million? All right. So there's roughly a little over two billion. That's with a B. So two billion Christians in the world right now. That's a lot, right? Right? But there's about five billion more people who aren't Christians. <gasps> So that's a lot. But this is what surprised me. I was doing a study with the kids uh, last week, and we were going through the book of Acts. And this shocked me. If you guys are in the book of Acts right now, chapter 1, turn to verse 15. And it's going to tell you there, after Jesus died, was buried, and rose from the grave, and then spent about a month talking with people afterwards, and he's just ascended send into heaven here. Peter's talking amongst the believers, and at the end of verse 15, how many <laughs> believers were in the world at that time? 120. Is that a lot lower than you thought it was? Or is that higher than you thought it was? That was a lot lower than I thought it would be. I mean, thousands of people heard the Sermon on the Mount. Thousands of people got fed their fill. I'm sure hundreds, if not thousands, were at this banquet where he turned water into wine. Many people were there yelling crucify. Many people were there and saw him dead. Many people were there and were witness to his resurrection, yet only 120 were believers at that time. That, to me, is wild. And that might not seem like a big number. It might not seem like a lot. But from that 120, we now have the over 2 billion. So even though that's not a huge number, we could fit 120 believers in here comfortably and still have room left over. So at that point in time, every believer in the entire world could fit comfortably in this church and there'd still be empty seats. But from that small, faithful group of people who had, trace, uh, who had uh, faith and trust in Jesus Christ, one person, through God, one God, we now have over 2 billion people who believe in Jesus Christ. So just think about that. If the 120 can have such a big impact through God working in their lives to eventually reach about a million people a year on average— there is no reason, like I think it was Alice who said, not enough. There is no reason why we can't have more and why places can't be overfilled. So we can't get caught up in a number game. Sometimes we can be like, oh, we want as much as we can get. We want as much as we can get. But we need to be joyful and happy and smile whenever we see people coming in the church that we haven't seen for a while or at all. 
there were some people that came in today I saw that I haven't seen for a while, and it made me smile. It, it, you know, it's, it's great to see people. We can get caught up in these numbers like, oh, you know, we only have this, we only have this, we only have this. But as long as we only have God, we have enough. <laughs> So next time you see somebody come in you haven't seen for a while or you see a new face, you should get so excited, so happy that there's a potential there to, uh, to have a relationship repaired or rebuilt or start. And it's all through the power of Christ. So even though the 120 is a small number to us because of them and because of God, we now have over 2 billion. We still got a lot of work to do. But what an amazing thing that we can all have an impact adding to those people who are going to know Jesus Christ personally, right? All right. So let's go ahead and pray. Yeah, Heavenly Father, um, yeah, that number shocked me whenever I was reading it with the kids. Only 120, only 120. Lord, you say that the, uh, the path is narrow. We were talking about this too. People say, why is the, why is the gate narrow? Because the gate only has to be big enough for Jesus to go through. And everybody else needs to go behind him. Lord, just let us be mindful of that, that it doesn't matter, Lord, if we have a packed house or one person that shows up, Lord, that heaven rejoices whenever one person turns to you. And it's great. Yeah, we'll keep praying for more and more. We'll keep praying for that abundance. There's nothing wrong with that, Lord. And we will see amazing things happen because of you, Lord. But let us get down to the personal level, the personal relationships, Lord. And uh, yeah, get back to how things are going to be. And how things were in the garden, Lord, walking alongside one another, personal relationships with you. And let us really nurture those and not get caught up in, in what we don't have, Lord, but just allow us to remain uh, faithful and blessed and just loving you, Lord, for all that we do have. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's prepare ourselves and be in an attitude of prayer. I'd like to also um, mention our family online. We will be continuing to pray for everyone who is watching who's out of town and not able to be with us. Um, also, some prayer concerns I'd like to lift up. Uh, the floods that are happening in Europe. We have also been asked to pray, pray, pray for Cuba. Also, we need to continue to pray for those who have been impacted by COVID around the world and in this country. So let's join together and take a moment of quietness and just focus on the presence of Christ and God and the Holy Spirit in this place. As we pray for our leaders and the ministries of this church, For our missionaries around the world. For members and friends, those who are here and those who are not able to be with us. For those who are homebound and their caregivers, friends and family. For those who are serving in the armed forces, We pray for those who are struggling with day-to-day -day life. We pray for those who are celebrating and those who are grieving. And especially, Lord, we pray that you help us to strengthen our faith to be people who stand in the gap 
between prayers that are spoken, unspoken, and too deep for words. And those who are so broken, they have no words to say. We ask that you help us strengthen one another in our needs and support each other. And we also ask that you help us reach out beyond our doors to those in need around us in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, in our communities. We thank you that you continue to help us be people of prayer, of intercession, of mercy. And we ask that you continue to help us lean upon your strength as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, <clears throat> hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <clears throat> Our scripture comes from the Gospel of Luke. Excuse me. Chapter 10, <clears throat> verses 25 through 37. A lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, the lawyer asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? What do you need there? What do you read there? The lawyer answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, the lawyer asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down the road, and when he saw him, he passed on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved to pity. The Samaritan went to him and bandaged his wounds, poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave it to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more that you need. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The lawyer said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus answered, go and do likewise. <clears throat> we have a lawyer who asks a question, but it could have been any person. It could have been a teacher, a parent, someone who's retired, a church member, a doctor. And he says, he asks, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus asks him, what does the law say? And the law says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and your neighbor. And Jesus says, yes, that's correct. This man knows the law. Do this and you will live. I mean, what more could he say? That's the answer. But then there's another question. And this is where things get a tad uncomfortable because the question is, who is my neighbor? The lawyer is wanting Jesus to define neighbor. He wants to know who his neighbor actually is. And there's a very good reason for this because by extension, he wants to know who his neighbor is not. Now, Jesus recognizes this tactic because we do it from time to time. It's our way of kind of, we get stuck on the minutia 
and we kind of avoid the bigger issue. And Jesus sees how this is going to play out, and so he just basically cuts through everything, and he tells a story, he tells a parable about a guy who's beaten and robbed and left for dead. Now, the first two people who see this man laying on the ground don't do anything to help him. While a Samaritan, who is the unexpected character in this story, is the one who renders aid. But there's a little piece we might miss if we know this story really well. What did the priest and the Levite see? Or a better way of putting it, who did they see? Who do we see and how do we see them? Could it be perhaps that the priest and the Levite saw the guy lying by the side of the road beaten as a burden, as an obligation, as a problem, as a hassle that they just didn't want to deal with, so they crossed to the other side of the road? Do we see people as a burden, as a hassle, as an obligation, as a problem? Are we seen? as a burden, as a hassle, as an obligation, as a problem. Who do I notice? Who do I see? Everyone who heard Jesus tell this parable knew <laughs> that the ending was completely wrong. Samaritans were not heroes of any story at any time. Whenever people in Jesus' time heard the word Samaritan, unless you were a Samaritan, you made a face. And what you were thinking in your mind was, ick. But you thought it in Hebrew. I like how one writer said, having the eyes of faith is a gift of God. Because you have to start seeing, and then you move to doing. How do we see who we see? There was a guide who was taking a group of people up Mount Everest. His name was Daniel Mazur. He passed another climber who had been left for dead by his own team. Mazur decided to help this fallen mountaineer. This is a true story. Which meant that not only would his group not summit, but the two paying clients he had would lose their money, and it cost about $60,000 at that point. This was a number of years ago. The fallen climber was an Australian named Lincoln Hall. He had succumbed to oxygen deprivation and had collapsed. His two guides had tried to help him, but then they just eventually left him. When Mazur found him, he was totally disoriented. He couldn't walk. No one knew Lincoln Hall. They never met him before. So Mazur's team stopped their climb to the summit to render aid. Now, while Mazur's team was rendering aid to Lincoln Hall, two other climbing groups passed them. And Mazur asked them to assist. And they refused. While they were interviewed later, they said they didn't understand the question. They lied. They just didn't want to stop. Mazur said, the summit is still there and we can go back. Lincoln only had one life. Ten days after Mazur rescued Lincoln Hall, another climber froze to death on the summit while 40 people walked by him. 
Now, this sounds really odd, but it still happens. And in the world of high altitude climbing, this behavior is acceptable. Because if someone judges someone as too far gone, if you look at them and say they're just beyond help, there's a possibility that you might render yourself in the same position if you assist. The problem is, of course, in assessing their condition. What do we see when we look at people and how do we see them? I remember going to a conference and we had, you know, breakout sessions where you go to rooms. And the room where I was in was, was smaller than the anticipated number of people, so we had people lining up along the wall. There was a woman who was struggling to stand up. And she was on crutches. And the host group didn't notice that she needed a chair to sit down because they were too busy dealing with all the other stuff that was going on. I, I had to ask them to get her a chair because they just didn't see it. Sometimes what we see is not what we think. When I first started in the ministry, I didn't really discuss the fact that I had cerebral palsy. It was just something that I had. I didn't really consciously, I didn't hide it, but I didn't discuss it. And after a service, a woman came up to me and handed me a card and said, here's a support group for AA. To which I said, thank you very much, I don't drink. And she looked me right in the face and said, denial is the hardest thing to overcome. <laughs> God love her. When I told her I had cerebral palsy, she was horribly embarrassed. But I learned from that that I have to actually tell people. Because <laughs> what you're looking at may be not what you actually think. And sometimes it just looks weird. <laughs> Health issues that we can't see but challenge people. Sometimes it just looks odd. What do we see when someone is in distress? Do we see someone who's a problem, a burden, a hassle? an obligation? Do we just not want to engage because we don't know what to say? Who do we see when someone is in grief? I remember when I was training as a grief counselor, the person who trained me said, when you're in grief, if you were doing this at any other time in your life, people would really be concerned because some of the stuff that happens while you're in grief is just really odd. I remember crying in the frozen food section over turkey because my mother did Thanksgiving dinners. And I just happened to be walking past the turkeys and that's all it took. I'm sobbing in the turkey aisle. People avoided me. <laughs> What do we see when someone walks slower than we would like and we're in a hurry? Or struggles in a store to manage technology? I was in one of those lines where, you know, you're like the second person from the cashier. There's someone right in front of you and then there's eight people behind you going because <laughs> they really want to get out of there. I literally could hear them breathing behind me. And this woman in front of me got stuck at one of those machines. It wouldn't work for her. She's pushing buttons. The cashier is pushing buttons. Everybody's pushing buttons, nothing's happening. She could not get the numbers in the keypad. 
So as I watched her struggle, and, and you could hear the, you know, grr behind me, hurry up, hurry up. I said to her, can I help you? And she looked at me and she said, I just can't get this to work. I said, you know what? This happens to me too. It just drives you nuts, doesn't it? So she kind of gave me this smile that was like, please rescue me. So we kind of pushed buttons together and we got the thing working. And the part that really struck me was when she turned to me and she was almost crying. I'm like, an act of kindness like that makes you cry. Some of the people in the line saw her as a burden, as an obligation, as a problem. Just get her out of here. We're in a hurry. Our ice cream is melting. Our lunch hour is ticking away. Our babysitter isn't home and we don't want to pay extra. Whatever it is. Sometimes we see people differently. And unfortunately, sometimes we have to admit it happens in the church. And we sometimes, without even realizing we're doing it, we kind of unsee people. But sometimes we get it right. And we see an opportunity to show mercy and love and compassion because that's what we have experienced in Jesus Christ. So who do we see when we look at people? Well, let's go back to the parable. And let's put ourselves in the position of the person who is lying on the side of the road. We're lying on the side of the road, torn up by life, by experiences, beaten up, brokenhearted, struggling. And people are walking by just not seeing us as hurting people. They're seeing us as burdened people. And then who comes along? Jesus, the good Samaritan, who picks us up, heals us, and carries us. You will never be unseen by the Lord, ever. He will see you every time. Jesus incarnated love so perfectly that not only he healed us, he died for us. He knew the cost of love and he gave it willingly. He knows what it feels like to be rejected and to be unseen. Here's the part about this parable that I really love. It's that the church is full of people who have been beaten and broken and left by the side of the road while others pass by. And our neighborhood is also full of people who are beaten and broken and left by the side of the road while others pass by. And the church is also full of people who understand the brokenness of others because we have been there and we have been given the mercy and healing of Christ. And you know what? The neighborhood has people like that too. They have experienced the love and healing and mercy of Jesus and they are sharing it in their neighborhood. And we can, too. It's an interesting parable that Jesus tells because it's not either or. It's often both and. Yes, at times life beats us up and tries to break us and stomps on us and leaves us by the side of the road. And yes, sometimes people walk by and yet, we have been tended to by our good Samaritan, Jesus Christ. And we have experienced that love and salvation in our lives. And we understand that wholeness. 
We don't always get this right, but we do keep working at it. We love because God first loved us. We show mercy because Christ has shown mercy to us. We move out in the church and in the community because the Holy Spirit has healed and tended to us. I run across people frequently who <clears throat> often tell me a similar story comes in different ways, but it's often ending in the same way. No one has ever done that for me. No one has ever prayed for me like that. No one has ever cared for me like that. No one has ever helped me like that. It always strikes me when I hear that kind of response to something that the church says or does. Because my first question is always, why not? Why haven't you experienced that in your life? Jesus asks us to understand this in a profound way. that as we encounter Christ more and more, we take on those qualities, those loving characteristics, and we share those with others. And we see people differently. And we begin to understand that all of us are seen by Jesus Christ. Jesus tells us, go and do the same. The one who showed mercy, who cared for the person who is broken, go and do the same because I've done that for you. Now you go do for others. And the way we do that is we lean upon that strength we pray for each other in that need. We ask God to help us. And then we see a little bit differently. And we don't walk by. We always stop. How can I help you? What can I do? How can I comfort you? And sometimes all we have to do is just be there and say nothing. Other times we can pray. Other times we can bring food, a phone call, a card, a meal, whatever it is. Jesus says, go and do likewise. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. Love your neighbor as I have loved you. Change the way you see things just a little bit, and you'll begin to see things differently. And you'll see people differently, too. And then we share that. And one day, maybe I will never hear again. I've never had anybody say that, do that, care for me that way. Because the church will have done it. Let us pray. Loving God, help us to see with new eyes and begin to see as you see, to care for those who are broken as we have been nurtured and cared for, and to continue to love one another as you have loved us. We thank you for this time we have to be together. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you for your help with the music. That was beautiful. And our benediction, go in peace to love and serve the Lord here and in the world. Amen. <laughs>